Uh, next up is Beth Boyd. Beth Boyd has been writing from an early age. First draft stories she left around the house for her eight siblings to read. Uh, later writing narratives for her mentor, Emily Crawford, who lived across the street. More recently, she has published essays in local and national publications, including Christian Science Monitor, Midwest Home and Garden, Minnesota Moments, and Parenting, and in National Public Radio's This I Believe series. Beth's passion for writing is exceeded only by her love of family, whom she writes about often. Please welcome Beth Boyd. stairs, downstairs, across the hallway. At 6 p.m., we all ate dinner, the one mom spent the afternoon preparing together, regardless of work schedules, team practices, or social lives. On Sundays, we went to St. Gregory's Church on Montreal off Davern, lining up to, lining up end to end with mom on one side of the pew, Dad on the other, and the nine of us spending 18 years swished in between. When we got older, we all worked for my parents' company, sweeping floors, filing orders, and answering phones. Every month or two, when a few of us began to look a little shaggy, Dad announced he was cutting hair. So all of us, whether we were the shaggy looking ones or not, lined up at the kitchen door and awaited our trimming. Some pleaded, just a little, Dad, no one wears their hair that short anymore. Others said authoritatively, trim the sides, nothing on top. Others meekly complied, thanks, Dad. When we were all under double digits in years, he would use the green plastic cereal bowl, plopping it on the top of our heads and cutting around the edges, especially for the girl's hair, to get it straight. When everyone was done, mom complimented our new styles, regardless of how we looked. <laughs> so it didn't surprise me when dad called up the stairs one Saturday afternoon. We're going to the movies, together. The movies? I poked my head over the banister. A movie? My first one. What movie? When? I don't know, dad said, as he grabbed his keys. Now, he said, the car is leaving in two minutes. I scrambled down the hallway among my older siblings' flurry of arms and legs, put on my socks and tennis shoes, and ran down the stairs two at a time behind my brothers and sisters. The engine was running, and Dad had the car in gear when we climbed into the back seat of the Chrysler. Ten minutes later, he and Mom dropped all of us off at the Highland Theater on Cleveland off Ford Parkway. The sound of music was playing. No other theater goers were in sight. The movie had started 45 minutes earlier. Dad reached out the car window and handed my older sister two $20 bills. Your mother and I are going to run errands. If we're not back after the first show, go back inside and watch it again. <laughs> we'll be back as soon as we can. I took a moment to look up at the bright running lights on the marquee and inhaled the salty smell of popcorn as I entered the theater with my siblings. After we saw the final three quarters of the movie, we stayed for the second showing of the same movie. When my parents came to pick us up, we were waiting in a clump on the sidewalk. It wasn't until much later that I discovered not all big families, not even all small families operated this way, but for us, it worked. As children, we stayed en masse. As adults, we have scattered, but not far from my parents' home. With nine spouses and 30 plus grandchildren added, we still gather at my parents' home every few weeks on bus. Thank you. And 
there is a photo here. We could not find a photo of all of the nine kids as children, but there are six of us here with another on the way. And if you'll notice, all of the girls have bold haircuts. <laughs> And the second essay I have is entitled Young Sins, and it's about growing up Catholic in St. Paul. <laughs> Mom, what's a sin? Mom straightened the newspaper on the coffee table, picked up my brother's two sweat socks and his blue Highly Roland baseball shirt, and moved the armchair back into place. A sin? Well, it's when you do something you know you shouldn't do, and you know that God won't like it. She picked up her coffee cup and saucer and walked into the kitchen with me trailing behind. I was homesick from school and bored. I began to ponder what my teacher, Sister Dorothy at St. Gregory's had taught our class about sinning over the past few weeks. My younger sister was napping and my five older siblings weren't home from school yet. I had mom all to myself, which offered a perfect opportunity for questions. Is it doing something the Ten Commandments say you shouldn't do? Sister Dorothy was teaching us about them as well. Yes, but it's more than that. You have to know it's wrong, too. She started loading the dishwasher. Is swearing a sin? I'd always been intrigued by the words, words that my older brothers were told not to say even more. Well, swearing is something your dad and I don't like, but I'm not exactly sure how God feels about it. Did I hear her right? So I can swear and not sin? <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, she said, finally rinsing a plate. When do you know something is wrong, I asked. I mean, really wrong. And what happens when you sin? She sighed, but answered. The church teaches us that age seven is the age of reason, the age when you finally understand right from wrong. She added the last of the dishes to the dishwasher, sprinkled in soap, closed the door, and turned it on. Then she sat down to make her grocery list for Red Owl in Highland Village, one of my favorite places to go with her. When we sin, we go to confession and say we'll not sin anymore. That's what Father Morin and Mrs. Hurley are preparing you for now, so that next year you'll make your first confession and first communion. Is that where all these questions are coming from? Yeah, I said and dashed off. I quickly calculated on my fingers. I had three months before I turned seven. <laughs> three months before I really knew right from wrong. Three months in which I could sin without fear of going to hell or suffering any punishment from God. What that punishment would be, I was afraid to ask. But it couldn't be too bad since I never saw my brothers and sisters suffer too much after they'd sin, and I knew they'd sinned. <laughs> I thought of a number of wrong things I could do, but swearing really was what I wanted to do without fear of eternal repercussions. I tiptoed into my brother's bedroom where my four-year-old sister was sleeping. I turned on the vacuum that mom had left there earlier. My sister instantly began to wail as I knew she would. Then, just as suddenly, I began to swear, saying every bad word I heard my brother say. They stopped. She stopped crying, stunned at my language, which she didn't understand but certainly knew was bad from the reprimands my brothers had received for them in the past. Before she could race out of the room to tell mom, I blocked the door and said, it's okay, I'm not sinning. I have three whole months to go. Try it, you have three years. 